So I'm going to share with you some thoughts about imaging and physiology. And if you want a decent reference, I suggest that you look at the Lancet article that Julio Guayumi and I wrote in 2017 of Lancet. So these are my disclosures. Intracoronary imaging and physiology are used to answer clinical questions that are shown on the left. And I will go through some of them. Randomized trials in non-left main lesions have shown that intracoronary physiology is a technique of choice in deciding whether or not a non-left main lesion should be treated, defer FAME 1 and FAME 2, and now define FLAIR and IFR sweetheart show that IFR was equivalent to FFR. There are, however, some circumstances in which IFR may be superior to FFR. One in particular is tandem lesions because the ability to create hyperemia or increased flow across one stenosis will be influenced by the presence of a second stenosis in an unpredictable way. And perhaps an acute coronary syndrome in which the microcirculation does not, response, does not respond to hyperemia as well as it does in stable angina, such that event rates in deferred lesions in patients with acute coronary syndrome and stable angina are similar in IFR, but are somewhat different after using FFR. There are a number of other hyperemic indices that have been developed. Many people consider these to be equivalent and that this is a class effect. There are advantages and disadvantages to considering all resting indices to be class effects. Specifically, if one index fails, the, other one, the others should also fail. Um, so there are some arguments as to whether or not um, additional randomized trials should be performed with DPR, RFR, and DFR. We have tried for years to identify anatomic equivalence to intracoronary physiology in non-left main lesions. And these are some of the IVIS studies, but you can see that the minimal lumen area is the one measure that is consistent, but the cutoffs range from two to four square millimeters. The negative predictive value tends to be high, which means that in some cases, it may be acceptable to defer intervention based upon a large lumen area. However, the positive predictive value averages only about 50%, which means it is never, never acceptable to decide to treat a lesion based on a minimal lumen area alone. OCT is no better than FFR, than, sorry, than IVIS in this situation. It's an issue of anatomy versus physiology. The main reason is shown in this slide, an elegant study from Jeju National University in Seoul, Korea, the amount of myocardium supplied by, say, a proximal LED is incredibly variable, and a minimal lumen area cannot take this into account, while physiology does take this into account. Left main lesions are somewhat different. Six studies have highlighted the inaccuracy of angiography in assessing left main stenosis. For example, in the study by Lindstadt, Four experienced interventional cardiologists agreed on the assessment of left main severity only 29% of the time, which means if you can't agree with your colleagues as to whether or not a left main should be treated based on angiography, how can you decide whether or not to treat that lesion? Here are two examples of osteal left main lesions. The top example was a patient who had bypass surgery actually twice for this osteal lesion back in the 1990s. This is a patient who had a, a, a pulmonary hypertension because of anomalous pulmonary venous return. And in both of these examples, Ivis showed that this is a normal, a normal left main, just an angiographic artifact. What technique should you use? There is equivalent data with FFR and Ivis, as shown by this elegant meta-analysis from Javier Eskenet's group at 30 months follow-up mean the event rate after deferral based on FFR and IVIS are about the same, which means that there is equivalent data for both. In order to use FFR, you need to understand some limitations. 
such as the presence of disease in the LAD. And in order to use IBIS, you must image from both the LAD and the circumflex, take the smallest lumen area, and make sure you disengage the guiding catheter if the lesion is very proximal. Another common question is what is the culprit lesion? As shown in the Vanquish study, as many as 50% of ACS patients, particularly non-STEMI patients, have no identifiable culprit or multiple potential culprits. OCT is probably the technique of choice in identifying plaque rupture, plaque erosion, red thrombus, and white thrombus, certainly better than IBIS. Here's a clinical example with two lesions in the circumflex. The distal lesion looks more severe angiographically, but is in fact the more stable. The proximal lesion looks the less severe angiographically, but is in fact the less stable of the two lesions. The prevalence of OCT-detected plaque rupture in STEMI is 70%, and non-STEMI is about 55%. We know that plaque ruptures in patients presenting with ACS should be treated, but there's emerging interesting data to suggest that erosions, the second most common cause of acute coronary syndrome, perhaps can be managed medically. This was first proposed by Francesco Fratti, and recent data from Harbin, the second affiliated hospital of Harbin Medical University in China, the erosion study suggests that this may in fact be true. I would not, I would not advocate doing this at the present time, but this is hypothesis generating concepts that should be done, or should be tested in a randomized trial as to whether a ACS lesion with an intact fibrous cap can be managed medically rather than with obligatory stent implantation. There are other causes of acute coronary syndrome, such as a calcified nodule shown here by IBIS and OCT. The first description of calcified nodules preceding the pathologic description came from intravascular ultrasound more than 20 years ago. And spontaneous coronary artery dissection rivals calcified nodule in terms of its prevalence. These are IBIS and OCT findings. When you see spontaneous dissection, if at all possible, the patient should be treated medically, assuming that this, that symptoms resolve and ST segments come down. The reason is shown in this example, you can see resolution of the spontaneous dissection with complete healing. The segments of the coronary artery that dissect spontaneously and then heal do not, do not develop recurrent spontaneous dissection. If the patient has a second episode, it'll be in a different segment of the coronary artery. Now let's talk a little bit about stent implantation. These are the predictors of early stent thrombosis and restenosis and MACE by IBIS and OCT after drug-eluting stent implantation. The number one predictor is stent under expansion. The number two predictor is geographic miss. All other findings seen by IBIS or by OCT are either secondary or not important. The assessment of calcification by intravascular imaging is critically important because calcification is the major limitation to stent expansion. It is not the stent itself. It is the presence of calcium. IBIS can look at the arc and the length. OCT can look at the arc, length, thickness, area, and volume. And it is not until you get at least three quadrants of calcium that the angiogram even approaches moderate sensitivity. We showed this more than 20 years ago, and the exact same data was duplicated recently from our group combining or comparing IBIS, OCT, and angiography. Here is a clinical example, a pretty decent angiographic result in a high-risk patient. Notice the impeller device, but on IBIS imaging, the minimal stent area is only slightly larger than the IBIS catheter because of severe circumferential calcium, something that was not seen angiographically, and stent under expansion also not seen angiographically. We have developed a calcium score to predict stent under expansion by OCT, combination of a maximum calcium angle of more than two quadrants, thickness more than a half a millimeter, length more than five millimeters. This combination is predictably associated with stent under expansion. 
I often show this slide. This is like a slide that this information came from the box of a stent that I just picked up off out of one cath lab. And looking at the minimal stent or the predicted minimal stent diameter by the manufacturer's compliance chart, say a 3-0 stent at 16 atmospheres, what does it actually measure by intravascular imaging? And the answer is 2.43 millimeters. Despite the fact that the manufacturers suggest that you should get 3.24 millimeters on average, on average it only measures 2.43. We have done this experiment many, many, many times. You achieve an average of only 75% of the diameter, two-thirds of the area predicted by these compliance charts because the compliance charts were determined in air or in water, while stents are implanted into vessels with plaques. And the limiting factor to expansion is not the stent design, but the environment into which the stent is implanted. Using intravascular imaging, we can modify the procedure using higher pressures and larger balloons to achieve a better acute result. People often ask, where is the data? This is the data, randomized trials, meta-analyses and registries comparing angiography to IBIS in white, OCT to angiography in blue, and data that has both IBIS and OCT data in yellow. Let's look at some of the data quickly. These are major meta-analyses incorporating both randomized trials and registries with IBIS, showing reduction of MACE, death, MI, stent thrombosis, and repeat revascularization. These are major meta-analyses just of randomized trials. And you can look at the largest randomized trials here. This is IBIS XPL and Ultimate, showing a 50% reduction in events at 12 months of follow-up. Almost identical numbers in these two trials, emphasizing how consistent this finding is. But it's most important to also realize you must optimize the procedure. If you optimize the procedure with IBIS guidance, you will have an event rate at one year follow-up of only 1.5%. If you don't optimize the procedure, the event rate will only be minimally better than angiography. Putting the catheter in the coronary artery does not improve the results. Optimizing the procedure based upon imaging does improve the acute results and long-term patient outcome. This is the largest meta-analysis comparing IBIS versus angiography, now 10 randomized trials, showing a reduction in cardiac mortality, reduction in mortality of 56%, MI, 45%, target lesion vascularization, 43%, and definite probable stent thrombosis of 56%. What about OCT? There's obviously less data because it's a newer technology, but the one randomized OCT versus IBIS trial from Japan show identical event-free survival curves at 12 months. And this Bayesian meta-analysis, three-way analysis done by David Capadano's group show that IBIS and OCT are better than angiography, and IBIS and OCT are essentially equivalent. There are some subsets I'd like to mention. These are two meta-analyses in the left main lesions treated by IBIS, again showing a reduction in all-cause mortality and cardiac mortality and MACE. The studies in these two meta-analyses are somewhat different, but the findings are remarkably consistent. IBIS is also incredibly useful during CTO intervention. This is an elegant review article by Fred Galassi. If you're interested, this is where I would start. And these are all the ways that IBIS can be used. Now, where is the data with OCT? There's been a randomized trial from Korea based upon either intention to treat or per protocol analysis. IBIS guided CTO intervention is associated with a two-thirds or three-quarters reduction in events at one year of follow-up. And then another study from Korea, there's something called the CAMIR registry, which is an online national registry supported by the Korean NIH of patients presenting with STEMI treated with primary PCI. 
And if you look at IVIS and OCT guidance compared to angiographic guidance, both IVIS and OCT are associated with a reduction in patient or device-oriented events. Patient-oriented events were mostly driven by a reduction in all-cause mortality. Device-oriented events were mostly driven by a reduction in cardiac mortality. So imaging guidance, primary PCI, again, improves mortality. If a patient presents with contrast-induced nephropathy, so if a patient presents with chronic renal insufficiency and develops contrast-induced nephropathy, the mortality at one year of follow-up is 25%. You're better off not treating the patient than putting the patient on dialysis after a PCI procedure. How do you minimize this? Well, there have been a lot of studies and a lot of devices, but to our mind, the simplest way to prevent contrast nephropathy is not to use contrast. Now, people think we're nuts. This is easy to do as long as you develop the proper mindset. Ziad Ali published a series of 31 patients in European Heart Journal. The series is now over 100 and will be presented at TCT in the fall. What about bifurcation lesions? Here are two bifurcation lesions, one in the left main, one in the LAD, crossover stenting, yet how do you decide whether this is significant in the side branch after crossover stenting? The best way is physiology. The top example, an FFR of 0.93 in the circumflex, 0.92 in the diagonal branch. Why is this rarely significant? Because these are often angiographic artifacts. There's eccentric vessel deformation with little plaque shift. The changes are extremely focal, and the amount of myocardium is um, only modest. In reality, doing FFR of the side branch is rarely necessary. If there's less than TIMI3 flow, you've got to treat it. If there is TIMI3 flow, then you shouldn't have to assess it, and you shouldn't have to treat it. This is from um, Ajay Kurtanay's um, white paper in circulation about CHIP, high-risk patients and lesions. This is the use of IVIS and OCT guidance according to the subset of high-risk patients and lesions, showing you how it is beneficial specifically in these patient subsets. The last topic I'll quickly talk on, touch on, is causes of metallic stent failure, whether bare metal stents or drug polluting stents. They present either with stent thrombosis or restenosis, and they can present at different time courses based upon the underlying stent type, the clinical presentation, and the time course. You can have a differential diagnosis clinically of the causes. If I had to pick one technique to assess stent failure, and I believe all stent failures should be assessed, it's OCT, because OCT can see certain things that cannot be seen reliably by IVIS. In particular, uncovered stent struts and the presence of neoatherosclerosis, although NEARS IVIS is good, also good for assessing neoatherosclerosis. Stent under expansion continues to be a common cause of uh, instant restenosis, and in fact, it's probably an increasingly common cause. If you compare stent under expansion after bare metal stents, first generation DS, and second generation DS, you can see that stent under expansion as a cause of restenosis has increased. Simply, we have gotten sloppy. We think we have better stents, it's not necessary to expand them as well, and that simply is not correct. This is data from the Prestige Registry looking at different time courses of stent thrombosis after DS implantation, and if we just look at very late stent thrombosis, you can see the appearance of neoatherosclerosis. That is the appearance of neointima that, that fits the criteria of a vulnerable plaque or vulnerable neointima. The pitic neointimal, neointimal rupture, and thrombus formation. This is, can be seen as early as three months after DS implantation, although it averages probably about 18 to 24 months in terms of its occurrence. Once a patient develops neoatherosclerosis, either by angioscopy shown here, or more commonly by OCT, the um, survival is markedly reduced 
compared to the absence of neoatherosclerosis. So as I mentioned, these are clinical techniques used to assess different clinical issues, answer different questions in the cath lab. And these are the techniques that are available. FFR, or resting indices, IBIS OCT, and some assessment of plaque composition. For example, non-left main lesions, physiology, left main lesions, FFR and IBIS, there's no data on IFR, optimizing stent implantation, IBIS and OCT seem about equivalent, left main better with IBIS, minimizing contrast better with IBIS, assessing stent failure better with OCT. So it's only in the cath lab do we look for a single modality to answer all the questions, which is the legacy of coronary angiography. You don't do this in any other part of medicine. It is important to know which patient and which clinical scenario will benefit from which imaging or physiology assessment. So to me, the argument is not FFR versus IFR or other non-hyperemic pressure ratio index, but physiology versus angiography. And the argument is not IBIS versus OCT, but imaging guidance versus angiography. 90% of your needs can be addressed with one physiologic tool and one imaging tool. You should pick one and get good at it. So what is the problem? Cost, which I understand, and in some devices, imaging devices are more expensive than stents, at least in some countries, and education. Education is critical, and I think we've done a pretty poor job. I think that's because most interventional fellowships do not require the fellows to learn imaging and physiology. And if they don't learn it during a fellowship, they're not going to adapt it when they are done. We have proposed and demonstrated the effectiveness of a cath lab-based imaging program that is based on non-physician directors and experts, perhaps supported by technicians and fellows. We started this in Washington Hospital Center, continue to Lenox Hill, and now in Columbia, and it's been adopted at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. It is effective if you have a cath lab that's large enough to support such an individual, and these individuals can become your partner in the procedure, understand the equipment set up and image and data interpretation that allow you to optimize the procedure and improve patient outcomes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Gary, for the excellent lecture on comparing the both outcomes. And the final message is that whatever modality you're comfortable with, you can use. It can serve 90% of the time's answer. But the idea is to use it and take appropriate measures after what they infer. I think he will be available with us for another 10 minutes. We requested him to stay for 10 minutes of discussion. If any of you have any questions or comments to Dr. Gary, please feel free to question. Can you pass on the mic in the hall? Any comments, Dr. Lucas or Sushil? But rather than a comment, it's just a thank you for this summary of all the evidence available. And I have to say that I'm still wondering, because sometimes it happens to me, that I still have colleagues asking for evidence about imaging, evidence about physiology, evidence about this, all these adjunctive devices. And I always ask myself, there's probably there is a matter of communication. Because for some reason, still, the interventional cardiology community does not know all this bunch of huge bunch of evidence and I have to say that in this perspective uh, we need to do something more because we have evidence we have all we need to increase the penetration of all, of all these devices and I have to say even in those countries where budget is not a problem because there is a specific reimbursement still the penetration of imaging as well as physiology is definitely very low can I ask Gary a comment on that? Do you think that's an education, the, the, your last point, right? There's, you know, you have sometimes information overload uh, and people are not educated in how appropriately to use the data uh, and that's why they don't use it or w what are your thoughts? I, I think there are two thoughts. I think education is an issue, especially in the fellows. We have surveyed fellows 
and we can document the fact that they're not getting trained. In general, one-third of fellows do not get adequate training in physiology, one-half in IVIS, two-thirds in OCT, and we've got data to prove that. But there's also a psychologic component. I think the interventional community has convinced itself that these are not important, and it's very hard to change somebody's mind once they have a negative impression of something. And the psychologists have shown this again over and over again. You can take somebody who believes in something and convince them that it's bad, but once somebody believes it's bad, it's almost impossible to convince them that it is good and necessary. Do you think all of these programs, whether it's FFR or IVIS, are adding on adjunctive tools, right? The co-registration with fluoro, giving the length of the lesion, looking at stent apposition, to make the procedure easier. I mean, for me, those things add value. And for a site to invest in something, the added value of some of those features may push them towards one direction or another, and may push them towards using it. I mean, in India, it's a cost issue, I think. It's a big cost issue, and there's only so much you can do about that. Patients are paying for these things. But when it's not a cost issue, those adjunctive tools seem to help, at least, and maybe convince people to use it. Maybe some comments from the panel. Go ahead, Gary. I think that's correct, but I also think that I think the impact will be somewhat limited, because the largest adoption of these devices, I mean, Japan has a 90% adoption of imaging. Korea has a 35% to 40% adoption of imaging without co-registration. So I do think it's mostly a matter of education. I would like to think that co-registration will help, but it's got to be easy. If it's complicated, no. Any other comments from the panel? Other important aspect of benefits versus problems, OCT is actually more user-friendly, and this angio-co-registration and all help us to learn it better. Wherever you have a doubt at that point, and you can do that, and probably in IVAS also they're trying to do something like that. One thing new which we learned out of your lecture is they have studies to show that even in ACS, acute coronary syndromes, MIs, then there's data coming up with that imaging helps. Before we close, Dr. Gary, we really liked your way of presentation. Another way to learn from these masters is he has put all the important headings on the left and enunciated each of the eight in detail on the right. The type of presentation also is quite appreciable. Thanks for your valuable time. And I would like to inform all that they were kind enough that anybody through Fax Foundation comes through, they would offer that imaging fellowship if any of youngsters are interested to at the CRF and the lab. Thank you. And any further closing questions from the audience? Make one other comment. Gary, so part of the goal of this TCT India is to sort of encourage a stepping stone, and maybe there's more value by attending TCT in San Francisco. If people here that are doing interventions want to get more in-depth, more understanding, more knowledge, I understand, obviously, the best way is a dedicated fellowship, but people can't do that. Is there, you know, from, can you summarize what, you know, from TCT, is there like a tract, you know, if they want to dedicate and focus on imaging? I know it's hard in two or three days, but what can people do? Yeah, so at the risk of angering everybody at CRF, that's not the way to learn imaging. You know, I summarized all the information on intracoronary imaging in about 15, 20 minutes. There'll be in-depth discussions of just about each point that I made, but unfortunately, the only way to learn imaging is to learn to interpret images and learn how to use it. It's hard to attend didactic conferences that do that. I actually think that these are better done locally, and they have to be case-based. Everybody wants to give lectures and show data. Lectures and data don't teach you how to interpret and use images. You learn to interpret and use images by learning to interpret and use images, either in conferences, case-based presentations, or even better in the cath lab. And I really applaud our colleagues in India if they would go ahead and develop 
that kind of a program. Maybe not, obviously, a dedicated long-term fellowship, but even, you know, a week-long program where there are cases that are reviewed again and again and again and teach people how to interpret the images, how to use the information. Yes, there'll be stuff at TCT for sure, but the only way to learn to interpret images and to use them is to learn how to interpret them and use them. Right. I think that's a great point. And Gary, thanks again for doing this webcast. It was a great summary and overview of everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gary, for your kind of time sparing and always encouragement for our local meeting here. And thank you once again. A big round of applause to Dr. Gary. Thank you, sir.